Hi, and welcome to the second week of the AP Daily Live videos on YouTube. If this is your first time here, let me say welcome. And if you were here with us last week, welcome back. My name is Sherry Pincham. I'm a teacher at Boston Latin School here in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'd like to welcome you to our review sessions, and we're here to help you to prepare for the upcoming AP World History exam. So let's get started. What will we learn? Well, before we get into what we're going to be doing today, let me do a quick overview of what we've done over the past week. So last week, those of you who tuned in last week, uh, we started with a review of units one through three. And that was done with uh, Mr. Logero. Then on Tuesday of last week, we reviewed units four through six. And then after reviewed units four through six, we went through units seven through nine. And then on Thursday of last week, we explored the five C's, which were skills and reasoning. So we have checked those off. If you were not with us last week, don't worry. Those videos are available on demand. So if you need to see those, you have an opportunity to watch each of those on demand. Now let's look at what we're doing this week. This week, we're going to focus on the themes and on Thursday, we're going to focus on test taking skills as well. So today, I'm going to focus on the theme of cultural development and social organizations. Tomorrow, Mason's going to be back and he's going to do a review of the themes of governance and economic systems. And then I'll be back with you on Wednesday. We'll look at humans and their environment, along with the theme of technology and innovation. And then on finally on Thursday, we will do some test taking strategies to get you ready for the AP exam that is coming up. So last week on Thursday, those of you who tuned in, I gave you a homework assignment. And so now I want to check in to see how we did on that homework assignment. So we ended that session with a short answer question, a short answer question. And the topic of that short answer question were two phenomenal leaders. We looked at um, Gandhi and Che Guevara, and we did some comparisons. That was the historical reasoning skill was comparison. And so many of you on the Google form wrote your response to part C of that SAQ prompt. So for those of you who weren't here, it is okay. You can still kind of go through the first part of this session with us and then kind of get a better understanding of how comparison looks like on a short answer question. So here's that prompt for those of us who weren't here or for those of us who need a quick review. So the prompt said, explain one way in which the images such as these can be seen as an example of political uses of art in the 20th century. So if you weren't here last week, go ahead and take a quick moment and kind of look at both images and think about ways that this could be used. Um, political uses, an example of political uses of art in the 20th century. Hopefully you got a chance to see both of them. And now I wanna show you some examples that I pulled from that Google form that would definitely earn the point for part C. So here's some sample responses. Um, on the SAQ from about Gandhi and Guevara. And again, I pulled these from your examples. And after I looked at them, I was like, wow, there are so many to choose from. But there were some that were kind of real, I thought would be really good use to um, share with you today. So here's some general ideas to consider. First, um, first of all, when, it look, when we're looking at short answer questions, understand that art will allow political leaders to reach largely illiterate populations. So you don't have to know how to read in order to understand the message of political art. Another general idea to consider is that the depiction of these revolutionary leaders as self-sacrificing, as they're participating in the struggle against foreign domination, were meant to inspire this sense of nationalism and also a sense of loyalty to the leader and the cause. So that's just a general idea to consider. And then the last one is a general idea to consider is that the image of Che Guevara in the military uniform with his eyes laser focused um, ahead tend to call for a fight that was reminiscent of political propaganda that was used in first, the first and second world wars. So it's kind of reminiscent of that idea. Now here is an example that I pulled from our Google form. So it's one of you out there who wrote this and thank you for giving us an example that we could use um, to uh, show how to write that short answer question. So this example said uh, a way that in images such as these can be seen as an example of political uses of art in the 20th century is that they each intended to mobilize citizens to support independence from an established institution by invoking a sense of national pride through the glorification of a political leader. Similarly, the Bolshevik party of Russia glorified their leader, Vladimir Lenin, 
in an artistic propaganda to demonstrate his leadership capabilities and to gain support of, from the peasants to establish a communist regime, regime in the czarist government. In all three of these cases, so we're looking at Gandhi, we're looking at Guevara, and now we're looking at Lenin. In all three of these cases, arts was used to make a political appear, leader appear stronger and resilient for the sake of gaining support of a, their political agenda, centering around the establishment of a new governing authority in place of the existing. So what I've done with this particular sample is we're gonna break this down just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And so what I wanted to do is introduce to you this strategy that I teach my students and I share with my students um, to kind of help them understand um, the writing of a short answer question. And hopefully you find this useful um, to help you write your SAQs um, on the upcoming AP exam. Now, if your teachers have already shared with you a strategy for writing the SAQ, Keep that strategy in mind because we don't want you to have you switch something up and try to learn something new at the last minute. So if you already have a strategy, good, keep it. If you need a strategy, that's what this one is about. So this strategy is called TIE, T-I-E. The T stands for topic sentence. The I stands for identify. And then the E in TIE stands for explain. So that's just a simple way to remember what to write as you are doing your short answer question. And I've, I've used this with this particular example from the Google form to illustrate the strategy of tie. So right at the top, the student has a topic sentence. In a way, a way in which these images such as these can be seen as an example of political uses of art in the 20th century, there's my topic sentence, is that they are intended to mobilize citizens to support independence from an established institution by invoking a sense of national pride through the glorification of a political leader. That's the identification. So the student has given us a topic sentence, which is the topic of the prompt, and then they tied it into identify. This was intended to mobilize citizens to support independence from an established institution by invoking a sense of national pride through the glorification of a political leader. We are identifying, we are identifying um, a way in which this image could be used. But then we have to do the E. And with this particular sample, the student actually gets to the E at the very end. It says, in all three of these cases, art was used to make a political leader appear strong and resilient for the sake of gaining support for their political agenda, centering it around the establishment of new governing authority in the place of the existing. What I liked about this sample is because the student who wrote this remembered that we were addressing the skill of comparison. And so they inserted that historical reasoning skill right in the middle, and I highlighted that for you. So here the student said, similarly, the Bolshevik party in Russia glorified their leader, Vladimir Lenin. So they're doing a comparison in the middle of a short answer question, which is good, which is good. It's not required, but I thought this was an excellent example that shows that the student understands the skill, but is also able to respond to the prompt by giving us a topic sentence, by identifying and then explaining, explaining one way in which these images could be used um, is a political use of art in the 20th century. So I thought this was a really good example. And I, I wanna say kudos to the student who wrote this one. I'm actually gonna use this with my own students when we do when we get to um, this practice SAQ um, coming up. So I really appreciate this example. And then there's another example, one more example, because like I said, there were so many, so many good examples to choose from on that Google form. So here's another example that would definitely earn the point. So I'll give you a moment to read it. And then we're gonna break it down the same way we did the first one using that um, acronym or that strategy tie. Topic sentence, identify, explain. So take a moment, read the example, and then we'll break it down. All right, hopefully you're like me and able to read this kind of quickly, but if not, no worries. We're gonna break this down together. First, in the example or the strategy of Thai, topic sentence, there it is right there, bam. The use of art in the 20th century, there it is, there are topic sentence. So you wanna include that in your uh, narrative of your short answer question. So one way in which the images such as these can be seen as an example of political use of art in the 20th century, we got our topic sentence. Next, the identify, for example, in the image, Gandhi, his physical condition and walking barefoot inspires others 
to join or to come and join him. So now we have identified what the image is all about. And then the student explains it. The student explains it said the purpose of this kind of art was to act as a form of propaganda to show the reality for two citizens and to inspire them and to spur them to take action. So it's a little out of order, but the student did use the strategy of a topic sentence. They identified something about the image and then they explained it and how, explained how it was used as um, a kind of art um, for uh, political use. So this was another good example. And again, like I said, we had plenty to choose from, but I just wanted to highlight these two as examples. So well done. Well done. Thank you again for doing your homework. And now let's move into what we have planned for today. So today we're going to look at some themes and we're going to be connecting these themes of cultural developments and interactions, as well as connecting the theme of social interactions and organizations. So we're looking at culture and we're looking at social, culture and social. Those are the two themes. And we're going to integrate a skill into these themes. So we're going to be looking at the skill of sourcing and situation. And just to refresh your memory, especially for those who weren't here last week, sourcing. When we're doing sourcing and looking at situation, we are to identify a source's point of view, the purpose, the historical situation, and or intended audience. We also explain point of view, purpose, historical situation, and or audience of a source. And then finally, when you're doing sourcing and situation, you got to explain the significance of that source's point of view, purpose, historical situation, and or an audience, and include how this might be limited, um, limit the use of these sources. So let's go. Let's start with an overview of cultural developments. And I just want to kind of give you a broad understanding of what cultural developments are, and then we'll look at cultural developments through the various time periods. So cultural developments are the development of ideas development of beliefs and religions and how they illustrate groups in society, how they view themselves and the interactions of societies and their beliefs. And they often have political, social and cultural implications. So that's what cultural developments and interactions are broadly. Now, if we wanna look at you know, an overview of cultural developments before the time period 1450, here we have what I call a study guide. This would actually make a great study guide for those of you who are trying to say, what should I study? What do I need to know? What do I need to remember? Well, here's your study guide. And my recommendation is that you pause this video, take a snapshot of this study guide, and then use this to uh, prepare yourself for the AP exam. And how you can do that is kind of, let's take a look at the list on East Asia. Here are some cultural developments that came out of East Asia before 1450. This is where we see Buddhism, um, first spread into um, East Asia from South Asia. And then we also see the development of Zen Buddhism in Japan. So this is another branch of Buddhism that's developing. We see the emergence of Neo-Confucianism in East Asia. And then finally, under cultural developments of this time period in East Asia, we see the cultural exchanges with the Mongols. Now, if you're looking at that list and you're saying, okay, Buddhism, I got it. Okay, Zen Buddhism, hmm. Oh, I don't remember that. Let me put that down on my list. That's what we want you to study so that you have an understanding of what was happening in East Asia besides just the spread of Buddhism, you know, understanding the different branches that came out. And then do the same thing with the next region, Dar es Salaam. Here under Dar es Salaam, we see the rise and spread of Islam. In the time period before 1450, this is where we see Islam reach its golden age. And so what does that actually mean? So that's one of the things that you want to make sure you understand. What does the golden age of an era mean? Because we see that a lot in history. But at this particular time, under cultural developments and interactions, this is the golden age for Dar es Salaam. Then we learn about, under this time period, the travels of Ibn Battuta. Now, if you're thinking about Ibn Battuta and you remember your lessons from Ibn Battuta, you're talking about, oh yeah, that's a traveler from Morocco who traveled over thousands and thousands of miles throughout Africa, Europe, and Asia. That's the guy. If you're thinking about Ibn Battuta, who is that? Put that on your list of things to study because you definitely want to make sure you know who Ibn Battuta is and the impact that his travels had on Dar es Salaam. And then finally, under Dar es Salaam, the Crusades. The Crusades, make sure you're understanding what's going on there. Southeast, South and Southeast Asia, we got the spread of Hinduism, the development of Angkor Wat. Make sure you know what that, that uh, complex is, that temple complex is. And then we see the spread of Buddhism and Islam into South and Southeast Asia. 
Pashti Buddhism kind of started in South Asia, but now it's spreading into Southeast Asia. And again, as you're studying, as you're preparing for the upcoming AP exam, make sure you're looking at what was going on in Europe before 1450 through the lens of cultural developments. Here we see that Christianity ex is expanding um, throughout Europe and into Russia. We introduce um, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox. Again, the, the term Crusades plays out in Europe, not just Dar es Salaam, but we also see it in Europe. And then under cultural developments, we meet another traveler. This is where you met Marco Polo and his travels from Europe into um, East Asia, where he spent time with the great Khan and eventually brought those um, experiences back to Europe and kind of exploded this idea of um, international trade. So if you've never heard of Marco Polo, make sure you put that on your list of things to study. And then finally, when we get to the Americas, this is all before 1450. Things to know, you got the Mayan region, you got Cahokia in North America, which is like the Midwest where we are today, the, where the Midwest is today. And then this is the beginning parts of the Aztec and Incan empires. So we see kind of the decline of the Mayan, but also the rise of the Aztec and Incan empires. So this is just a snapshot this is just a snapshot of cultural developments. And this is a good way for you to kind of look at things that you need to know, things that you should maybe study. And if there's something on this, uh, this overview that you're like, I have no idea what that is, that's what you want to study first. That's what you want to study first. Now let's do the same thing. This time looking at the lens of social interactions and organizations. Now by definition, a social interaction and organization is the process by which societies group their members and the norms that govern the interactions between these groups and between individuals that influence political, economic, cultural, and cultural institutions and organizations. And again, this is just a snapshot, or if you want to call it a study guide, these are some things that you should know about social interactions before 1450. So again, starting with uh, East Asia, when it comes to social interactions and organizations, we got to know about gender roles in a pastoral society. What roles did women play? What roles did men play in those pastoral societies? What role did women play in Buddhism? Again, that's a social interaction and organization. Hopefully your teachers taught you something about foot binding. If not, put that on your list of things to study because that is something that deals with social interactions and, and interactions and organizations in East Asia, in East Asia under the Song Dynasty. And then you're gonna start to see this word come up over and over again throughout each of these regions before 1450. The word is patriarchy. If you don't know what that means, that is a society where uh, patri, which means male, is um, usually in charge. They're usually um, the ones leading the way. So you'll see patriarchy in East Asia. We'll also see patriarchy in many African societies. And we'll see patriarchy in South and Southeast Asia. That's going to be a common theme. That's going to be a common theme. Even in Europe, patriarchy, it's going to be on the list. So uh, make sure you're understanding that. But then when we get to the Americas, not necessarily patriarchy, but instead in societies like the Aztecs, and the Incas, they practice something called gender parallelism. And so this is where we kind of see men and women kind of operating in parallel um, arenas, but they were also viewed as equal, having equal value in society. And so those are some of the terms is when we come to uh, social interactions and organizations that you should know for the time period 1450, uh, before 1450. And again, this is just an overview just an overview. I know some of you may be looking at the list like, wait a minute, can we talk a little bit more about the caste systems in India and South Asia? Or what about the role of women played in Christianity and Buddhism? Again, this is just an overview. This is just an overview. This is an opportunity for you to kind of look at the list, see which things you know well, see which things you're like, oh, I don't really know that well. So now I want to focus my attention and study those things. So now let's look at an example. And again, remember we're in a time period before 1450. So we're still in that time period before 1450. So here is a sample primary source. We're gonna look at this sample primary source. First, we're gonna just look at it to understand it. And then we're gonna look at it through a cultural lens. And then we're gonna look at it through a social lens. And then we're gonna use this same primary source to practice the skills of sourcing and situation. So again, pause, take a moment to read this primary source, make sure you have an understanding of it, and then we're going to use it to practice the themes, look at it through the thematic lens, and then the practice the skills. So pause the video. Whew. 
that's not a lot of time to read. If you're still reading, please continue to do so, because like I said, we're going to look at this same primary source through a social lens, through a cultural lens, and then we're going to use this same primary source to practice the skill of sourcing. So if you're still reading, no fret, no harm, we're going to look at this a lot. So um, we're going to keep things going. So let's first look at this same primary source through a cultural lens. So we're looking at the theme of culture. We're trying to identify some cultural developments and interactions. And so I've highlighted some of those for you. So in the very first sentence, it says, in the past, many Muslim rulers. So Muslim rulers gives us, oh, we're talking about Islam, the spread of Islam. Okay, I know what we're talking about culturally. Okay, now I have the mindset. Okay, we're looking at um, the, the spread of Islam. Now, another cultural development, like we said, um, this is coming from the Seljuk Empire. So now we've kind of placed this in the early time period before 1450. So we know we're talking about Muslim rulers and we're looking at the Muslim Seljuk empire of that particular time period. So that's the cultural lens that we're looking through. Now let's see if we can use this same primary source and view it through a social lens, through, through a social lens. So um, we're looking at social structures here or how things are socially organized. And I've highlighted that for you too. So it says, in the past, many Muslims, so we, now we know the cultural is the spread of Islam, have had the following practices regarding the training of military slaves, also known as gula. So we're looking, okay, socially, we're looking at labor systems. We're looking at labor systems or military slaves. And so that's our social system that we're looking at. And then this particular paragraph, this particular primary source is kind of giving us an insight on how one moves up the social structure. How does one move up? How does one advance in rank? And so the um, senior advisor here is kind of telling us exactly how one moves up in the social organization. How does one move up? It says, first, after young males, slaves have been brought into government service, they would be gradually given an advancement in rank according to the length of service, education, skill, and general merit. And then it goes on to say, first, you serve as an assistant to the cavalry man, and you do that for one year. So first you start off as a military slave, then you move up to an assistant to the cavalry man. That's one year. Then after that one year of service, you're given a horse and you're trained to ride. Now you've moved up another rank and that's usually for about three or four years. By the fourth year, then you're given a quiver of arrows, a bow case, and then you would start training, learning how to shoot and to fight. You've moved up another level on the social um, uh, organization. And then by each passing years of service, your rank and your honors would be increased. So this is kind of showing us the social organization within this Muslim society. This is how they would move up. And then finally, um, it says at the last sentence, the last two sentences, he would be given, uh, become a troop leader. And finally, when you turn 35 years of age, you would assume the uh, served as a, a ruler honorably and given every respect. Then you would become appointed governor. And then finally, you're at the top of the social structure. You become a minister. That is the social structure of this particular um, society here. So we looked at it through a cultural lens. Then we looked at it through a social lens. Now, what are we gonna do next? We're gonna source this document. Let's source this document. So we have a better understanding of what this document is telling us to do. So let's practice the skill of sourcing. Same document, same document. Y'all are going to love this document by the end, by the time we get through with it. So sourcing it. So the first way we're going to source it is using historical situation. And one of the things that I wanted to remind students is that when you're sourcing, you don't want to just identify the historical situation. You also want to explain the significance of it as well. So here I've highlighted that the historical situation is in the past, Many Muslim rulers have been, um, had the following practices regarding the training of their military slave known as Gula. Then the historical situation is that this particular advisor is saying, unfortunately, this system that we've had in place for many years is not being followed by rulers today. That's the historical situation because they're kind of explaining that at first we were doing it one way. Now these new rulers want to do it a whole different way. They're not even following the rules that we've had in place. Now, this is around 1020, I mean, 1092, it's 1092. So we've identified the historical situation, but remember I told you, it's not just identifying what the situation is, you also have to explain the significance. 
Now, why is this important? Why is this important that they're no longer doing things the way they used to do things? Well, if you understand the situation, the Seljuk Empire is on a decline. And this particular advisor is telling the Sultan, like, look, we're not doing things the way we used to. We might want to return. We might want to return to the way we used to do things. Otherwise, um, the Seljuks may not be around too long. So that's the significance of that historical situation. They're noticing that the Seljuks are on the decline and this advisor is kind of pointing it out in hopes to kind of turn things around. So that's the historical situation. So we've, um, we've explored it with the historical situation. Now let's see if we can source this same document, this time using intended audience. So with intended audience, what I tell my students to do is go straight for the source. Go straight for the source. You got Nazim al muq He is a senior advisor to the Sultan of the Muslim Seljuk Empire. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. That's not the source. I mean, that's not intended audience. You got to go further. So it is a, a piece of advice. It's a treatise that was composed. But the why? Why is this senior advisor telling the Sel Sultan um, this information about the ranking system that's no longer being used? Because he wants him to do something about it. He's an advisor, he's an advisor. So his intended audience is the Sultan of the uh, Muslim Seljuk empire, but he's an advisor. So he's giving him wise counsel. He's telling him, this is what we need to do if we wanna turn things around. So when you're doing intended audience, you don't want to just say, oh yeah, this is for the Sultan. This is just for the Sultan, but the why, don't forget the why. The why is an important part of sourcing. Now let's source this same document, using purpose, using purpose. So this would be the reason why. So again, I've highlighted the word advisor because I wanted students to kind of look at, this is a piece of advice. This is an advice. He's an advisor and that's what advisors do. They are wise counselors. They give advice to um, important people. So he's given some advice to the ruler. Can I just leave it right there? Of course not. You gotta say the why, why? Does he want him to do something about it? Of course. So he's given some advice to the Sultan of the Muslim Seljuk Empire because he wants him to turn things around. He does not wanna see the empire fail. So he's telling him, this is the way we used to do things. Unfortunately, this system is not being followed by rulers lately, including yourself. So you might wanna follow the rules. You might wanna follow the rules. You might wanna follow these practices that have been in place for decades so that we can get things back on track. That's his why. He's given some advice. He's a wise counselor giving advice to the emperor. I mean, the sultan. I'm sorry, not the emperor, the sultan. And then finally, point of view. Let's source this same document using point of view. And here, the, we got a senior advisor to the sultan. He's given some advice. He's telling him we need to go back to the ways things used to be. And then the other thing about point of view is the why. Don't forget the significance of it, the why, because he wants the Sultan to change. He wants the Sultan to return to the way things used to be. He was like, we used to have these practices regarding military training. It worked. They started on foot, then they became an assistant, and then they were given a horse, they were trained to ride, and they were given some arrows, and then yada, yada, yada. We had a system in place that worked. Now, this system is not even being followed. We need to return to the way we used to do things because it worked, it worked. And so he's given some advice because he wants to see the return to tradition, the return to the way things used to be. That's his point of view. That's his point of view. So don't forget the why. Oftentimes students will say, oh yeah, we got a senior advisor talking to the Sultan. Senior advisor talking to the Sultan. Why? Why is he talking to him? Why is he talking to him? So that's the key part of doing sourcing. So we've looked at sourcing. We've looked at cultural developments and social interactions from the time period before 1450. Now we're gonna transition and look at an overview of cultural developments from 1450 to 1750 and from 1750 to 1900. So this is a, a, a study guide, so to speak, or just a snapshot of what was happening at this particular time period. If you're looking at the list, I want you to uh, take a screenshot or pause the video, make sure you know what each of these things are. If there's something on these two lists, if you're like, so say for example, you're looking at European enlightenment, like, wait a minute, I don't remember. I don't remember European enlightenment. Put that on your study guide. That's what you need to know. Uh, if you're looking at Protestant Reformation, Neo-Confucianism, Sikhism, the emergence of Sikhism in India. If that's something that you haven't studied or if that's brand new to you, put that on your study guide and make sure you review that before the AP exam.
Same thing with the time period 1750 to 1900. These are some major cultural developments that came out of this time period. The major ones include the cultural expression of nationalism. So nationalism sometimes goes under the theme of political, but it is also a cultural expression. So it fits the theme of culture as well. Enlightenment ideas, typically we learn about that as a political, maybe social, but the Enlightenment can also be um, viewed as a cultural theme as well. Imperialism used to spread that Western ideology or that Western culture, social Darwinism, colonial racism. These are all examples of major cultural developments that came out of the time period 1750 to 1900. So if you're looking at this list and there's something on the list you don't know, that's your job to study that list, okay? And then the final time period of cultural developments, we're looking at the time period 1900 to the present. Again, another list, all it is is just an overview an overview of what was happening at this particular time period. So some of the major cultural developments that came out of this time period, you got, of course, the rise of communism, fascism, globalization of culture, particularly pop culture. Um, you can look at that, modern feminism, and the list goes on and on. Anti-Semitism and how that leads to genocide and these global tragedies that we're learning about. Uh, religious fundamentalism. Under um, that one, you can look at Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam religious alternatives to fundamentalism. So if the word fundamentalism is something you've never heard of before, if you're not familiar with, put that on your list of things to study. And then the list goes on. Um, increase of criticism of capitalism, the global culture of liberation, nationalism, specifically nationalism in Japan, Italy, Germany. We're gonna see this Islamic renewal as a cultural development in Iran, the modernization of Turkey, and then religion and politics in India. These are all major cultural developments from the time period 1900 to the present. If there's something on this list that you're not familiar with it, you know what to do. Now let's look, do the same thing with social interactions and organizations. So an overview of social structures from 1450 to 1750, you got female merchants in Southeast Asia, and you also have the emergence of women and the roles that women are playing in the Mughal and Ottoman empires. We see under this time period, the role of women in the enlightenment. You see, we learn about enlightened thinkers who were women and the scientific revolutions. You learn about some scientists who were women, not just men. Uh, social structures in North and South America, the effects of the slave trade and the gender roles that were played out in um, Africa as a result of the slave trade. So again, these are major social interactions and, and organizations from that time period. The effect that the fur trade had on gender roles in North America is a major theme of this time period. The decreased roles of women in the Philippines, um, the decrease of pastoralism, we're gonna see that as a social interaction and organization in China and Russia, multiculturalism in China. And then the last thing on the list that was a major theme would be the trade goods being used as social status. So trade goods, the more that you had, the more your status was increased. In the time period, 1750 to 1900, you got class systems in the Americas. You got new elites. You got old elites in South America. Make sure you're familiar with all of those. Migration patterns. We see a lot of migration patterns and the effects that they have on social structure. So as people moved and migrated from Africa, even though that was a forced migration, make sure you know that that was a forced migration and not uh, something that was done um, willingly. Um, migrations from Asia and migrations from Europe. The effects of revolutions that they had on class and gender. The roles that women played in the Atlantic revolutions. Hopefully your teacher have lifted up and amplified and shined the spotlight on women and their role in the Atlantic revolutions. If not, make sure you find your one. Make sure you find one woman who was a part of, an integral part of those Atlantic revolutions. The Haitian revolution, the effect that it had on class, race, social, social structures. Feminism, this is where we start to see early forms of feminism. The abolition of slavery and serfdom and then how that impacts social structures and organizations. The Industrial Revolution, that's all about social structures. When we introduce a new working class and the middle class as a result of industrialization. And of course, the role that women played in Industrial Revolution, Meiji Japan, and the role that women played in Africa. And I know some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, she's talking a lot about women. Well, that's what 
social org interactions and organizations are all about. We're talking about how how the groups are interacting with each other, but also the impact that it's having and the influence it's having on political, economic, and cultural institutions and organizations. And then finally, let's look at some general themes of social interactions in the period 1900 to the present. So this is probably where many of you are if you haven't already finished the uh, the, the curriculum already. We're right here with looking at social interactions in this particular time period. So you're learning about the globalization of feminism, the changing uh, family structure as a result of um, these expanding ideologies, feminism under communism, the global population booms, the migrations. Um, you probably learned about fascism and how that played out with gender and class, the urbanization and elites of the USSR, and the list goes on and on. Again, what do you do with this list? If there's something on the list you're not familiar with it, that's where you pause the video, you write it down, you take a snapshot of it, and you study it, and you study it, because these are the major social interactions, the major um, organization, social organizations from the time period 1900 to the present. So what we're going to do in our last few minutes together, we're going to look at an example, we're going to look at an example, and we're going to use the theme of social interactions and organizations and look at a DBQ prompt. So if you remember that list, that list from 1900 to the present, there was a lot of things on the list. Well, I do want to go deep with two of those items on the list, uh, one being feminism under communism and social changes from the communist revolution. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth. I know some of you are saying, well, can we go a little bit more in depth with one of these? Well, let's do that now. So here's a sample DBQ prompt. And again, we're looking at it through the theme of social interactions and organizations. So the prompt says, using the documents provided and your knowledge of world history, analyze the degree to which communist movements affected women's struggle for rights in the 20th century. So again, we're looking at this particular prompt through a social theme. We're using the, te the theme of, of, of social structures um, and social organization. We're going to look at feminism under communism and then the social changes that came as a result of that. So y'all with me so far? Social theme, DBQ, sample prompt. So when you're writing a DBQ, when you're writing a DBQ, here is an outline, a, a quick example of how you can outline your DBQ. And so this is something that I share with my students. If your teachers have already given you a, a guidelines on writing an outline for a DBQ, I don't want you to change it midway through. You know, the exam is only a couple of weeks away. Or for those of us who've taken it in June, we still got a little bit of time, but you don't want to change up your strategy midway. But for those of us who are still like, I don't know how to outline a DBQ, this is for you. This is for you. So when you're outlining a DBQ, you want to have an introductory paragraph, and that's where you have your contextualization statement and your claim, aka your thesis. Your next few paragraphs are your body paragraphs. And using this DBQ as an example, our first body paragraph, we will talk about one effect that the Communist Party had on women's struggle for rights. And when we break that body paragraph down, we're going to look at a, um, a topic sentence, the main point from our thesis. We're going to look at which documents we could utilize to help support that thesis. We're going to look at some outside evidence and then finally a source analysis. We're going to source that document and we're going to do the same thing with our next um, body paragraph. This will be the second effect that the um, Communist Party had on women's struggle for rights. And then in your third body paragraph, this is where you have your third effect, your third effect. So this is a good way and a quick way to kind of help you organize your thoughts when you're looking at a document based question. And then in your final paragraph, this is where you would have your conclusion and again, Conclusions aren't required, like they don't get scored, meaning that if your students run out of time, it's not going to lose a point like, oh, man, this student didn't write a conclusion, minus one point. We don't do that at the reading. Everything that we do is what we call asset model grading. So we grade you on what you do right, not what you do wrong. So we're not taking off points if there's no conclusion. But if time permits, go ahead and write your conclusion. Go ahead and write a conclusion. This is where you can restate your thesis statement and then show off your complexity, show the connections that these documents have and show how you can modify or um, support and change your, your argument based on uh, what you have written. So let's practice. Let's practice. In these last few minutes, we are going to practice writing a DBQ. We're going to practice writing a DBQ. So here is a sample introductory paragraph. So I want to give you a moment to kind of read it, 
This is a sample introductory paragraph. The first part is a contextualization statement. The second part, that underlined part, is what I call a thesis statement. So take a look at it. Take a look at it. So now if you had a chance to read this introductory paragraph, again, it's just a sample, let's kind of break it down. And for my students that are still reading, no harm, no foul, we're gonna look at this for a few minutes. So you'll have time to kind of look through it uh, carefully before we um, keep things moving. So um, first thing I wanted to point out was the contextualization statement. So at the very beginning, we have this broad historical context, this broad things that are happening. So communism was spreading across the globe in the 20th century and women continue to struggle for freedom, freedom throughout the world. So we got this big context. This was happening in both global uh, capitalist societies and communist societies. But here's where I draw the arrow. The arrow represents the connection or the relevance to the prompt. But it says, but it was the communist revolutions in Russia, in China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, in Romania, that radicalized the push for equality for women. This is now we're connecting this broad historical context of communism spreading across the globe to the topic of the prompt, which is the push for equality for women or the struggle for, uh, for, for women's rights. So now I've connected it to the topic of the prompt. That's what you have to do for contextualization. You have to take something broad and then make it relevant. Take something broad and connect it to the topic of the prompt. So that's what I've done here. It radicalized the push for equality for women, helped the suffragettes everywhere. Then here's my thesis statement. So communism, re communist regimes initially enacted some gender reforms in order to gain a fe female following. That's just one part. We call that like one part of my claim. This is actually a three-part claim. And this is why I wanted to show you this one because this is actually gonna lead really good into writing and outline for this particular DBQ. So part one of my thesis is that communist regimes initially enacted some gender reforms to gain a female following. That's part one. Part two of that claim, some even had a special part in the government devoted to women. Whereas capitalist societies in the West, women still struggled for the right to vote, to have jobs, to gain a political voices. So that's part two. Some even created a special part of the government just for women. Then we get into part three of my three-part um, thesis statement. But as feminist movements became more radical, communist governments then began to slow this reform, started to slow things down. They're like, wait a minute, the women are getting a little more radical. The women are getting a little bit more demanding. So despite these positive changes, women were still subjugated under patriarchal views that had bound them for centuries. So that is part three of my thesis. So this is actually gonna lend itself really good to outlining this particular DBQ because this part here will become my first body paragraph where I use documents to support my claim that um, communist regimes initially enacted gender reforms to gain a female following. Then my second body paragraph comes here where I talk about um, they having some special part of the government devoted just to women. And in my third part, my third body paragraph is where I start to talk about despite these changes, women were still subjugated to patriarchal views and the communist government started to slow down some of these reforms. So let's kind of take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. We got a few minutes left. Let's take a look. So here's document three. This is just one document of this DBQ. And again, I'm whole purpose of doing this is one, so you can look at it through a social lens, but two, so we can outline this particular DBQ. So it says, the source, Communist North Vietnam Constitution of 1960. Article 24, women of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam enjoy equal rights with men in all spheres of political, economic, cultural, social, and domestic life. Again, this is coming from the constitution. For equal work, women enjoy equal pay with men. The states ensure that women's work, workers and office employees have fully paid periods of leave before and after childbirth. And then the states protect the mother and the child and ensures that the development of maternity hospitals, daycare and kindergartens. So that's just one source, that's just one document. And you know what we're gonna do with this, right? You know we are about to source this document. So let's source it. Uh, but first, let me give you how we would source this and use this in our outline. 
So we have our sample first body paragraph. So let me back up a little bit, make sure you're following with me. So we got our intro. We got our intro with our contextualization. Here's our argument right here. Here is our claim, our three-part claim. Now we're ready to write that first body paragraph using this document. So our first part of our thesis statement, the main point of our topic sentence is that communist regi regimes initially enacted some gender reforms in order to gain a female following. I'm gonna use document three as evidence. I'm gonna give you some outside evidence and then I'm gonna source that particular document. So let's take a look at it. As you're looking at document three, as you're looking at any of the documents, you wanna think about how is this gonna help me support my thesis? That's what you wanna go into each document looking for. It's like, how is this gonna help me? How can I use to support my argument? And in this particular case, my argument is gender reform to gain a female following. So they made some changes with this constitution to get more women behind um, this, the buy-in buy into this constitution. And so that's what you wanna think about with this particular document. And so now we sourced it. Let's take a look at how we would source it. So I have a copy of the document here. We're gonna source, it's the um, uh, Communist North Vietnamese Constitution that was drafted in 1960. If we wanna source it using historical situation, we can kind of think about what was the situation, what was kind of going on that kind of prompted, that led to the creation of a constitution in 1960. Well, in 1954, Vietnam was divided into two separate nations. Then in 1960, the North Vietnamese government went into war with the Republic of Vietnam via its proxy at Viet Cong. And this was an attempt to annex South Vietnam. So this is the context of what was happening that surrounds this particular source. So that's the context of the historical situation of this one source. The intended audience, I put this down as the women of Vietnam because this, this particular article is talking about women's rights, women getting a, uh, equal rights to men. And it gives examples about equal pay, paid leave, um, access to um, child care and uh, or say it's protecting mother and child to ensure the development of maternity hospitals. This is aimed at women. So this is the intended audience for women. The purpose is to try to reunify Vietnam under a communist party. Because again, remember it's coming from the North Vietnamese. They're trying to reunify Vietnam under communism. And in the point of view, the point of view of this one document, it says in North Vietnam, Vietnamese constitution, it not only claims democracy, but claims women have complete equality to men. It is also a government document, so it serves as a living document, like most um, constitutions do, with a set of ideas that glorify Vietnam as a country flooding with equality to gain the support of all Vietnamese people, specifically women. So we have now just sourced this one document. So before we leave, because I'm looking at the time and we are, are almost done, I want to give you a sample first body paragraph. So before we leave, we gave you a sample context, we gave you a sample thesis, and now let's just work through a first um, sample body paragraph. So you've written your thesis, you got your contextualization statement, this is what comes next. We start with a topic sentence. Communist regimes initially um, enacted to gender reforms to gain a female following. And then I have um, a part of the source here. For example, in the North Vietnamese constitution, it not only claims democracy, but claims women have complete equality to men. Now you notice I didn't write verbatim what the, what the document was. And that's what we want students to do. We want you to summarize the document, not necessarily write it verbatim. Um, and then we bring in some outside evidence. Outside evidence. In 1954, Vietnam was divided into two separate nations. In 1960, the North Vietnamese government went to war with the Republic of Vietnam via its proxy at Viet Cong. So if you notice in the document, nowhere does it talk about the division between North and South Vietnam. So I'm bringing that in as outside evidence. And then finally, we analyzed it, um, source analysis, at the very bottom, it said, it is the government document, so it serves as a living document with a set of ideas that glorify Vietnam as a country flooded with equality to gain the support of all Vietnamese people, especially women. In reality, this is where my analysis comes in that women in Vietnam did not enjoy many of the reforms that were outlined into that constitution until much later. There's my analysis. So this is a sample of a, a first body paragraph that you could use if you were responding to this particular DBQ. So what would be the next steps? The next steps, after you did that first body paragraph, you would do the same thing over again. Think of it like rinse and repeat. 
So you would use another document that you would use to support um, the main thesis point for the topic sentence. So again, my thesis point is gender reform to gain a female following. I use document three. And again, if you had access to all the documents, you would see that you could probably find two more that would kind of support this claim that gender reform was done in order to gain a female following. Then you'll give outside evidence and then source analysis. Now we're done with our first body paragraph. Then we go into our second body paragraph. Now we're using the second part of our thesis statement, which says it was a special part of government that was devoted to women. And then you would see which two or three documents could be used support, to support this particular claim. Come up with some outside evidence and then do a source analysis, either historical situation, uh, pur purpose, intended audience, or point of view. And then rinse and repeat. Do it again with the third part of your thesis statement. So that's why it's good to have a three-part thesis here because then that gives you a nice way to do a nice setup for three um, body paragraphs. So the third part, as feminist movements became more radical, communist, communist governments began to slow this reform. Which two or three documents could use, be used as support, some outside evidence, and then your source analysis. Then you would have your conclusion if time permits. Now, we've only done two body paragraphs together. We did an intro paragraph and we did that first body paragraph. Did you know that already we earned the thesis point and we also earned the contextualist patient point? And let me go back real quick. Ah, let me go back real quick. What you would need to do to earn the other points for your evidence points. So you would have to use at least three documents to get that first point of evidence. You would have to support your claims with at least six documents. And so that's why we're talking about how could we support our argument? How can we support our argument? Again, I use that term over and over again. How do you support your argument? And then evidence beyond the document. That's where you take something that's outside of the seven given documents and use that to um, support your claim. And then the last two points come from sourcing and um, the last one is reasoning, where you talk about how your argument could be modified, how you can qualify your argument with these documents, or how you can corroborate, how two documents kind of support and reinforce what you're trying to say here. So a DBQ, total out of seven points. So whew, I'm glad y'all are still hanging in there, because this was a whirlwind. This was a whirlwind of information. But of course, you have access to this. So what should we take away? What are our major takeaways? Well, to wrap up, some common mistakes that I've seen as a reader is misidentified themes where students will say, oh, this is a social theme when really it's more of an economic or misidentified things that say, you know, this is cultural when really it's more political. So make sure you are um, carefully identifying what the themes, if the themes are um, embedded within a question. Um, another common mistake that I see is that students tend to look at themes in isolation. They see that you know the cultural theme is not connected to social or that social is not connected to politics or politics are not connected to uh, economics. So make sure you understand that the themes do connect. And then the other common mistake that I see when it comes to sourcing is students most often forget the why. Like we talk about the purpose, but the why. The intended audience, why? The point of view, the why. So make sure you include that as well. So the specific examples, make sure it's relevant to the question. If the question is asking you about cultural, make sure you talk about culture. If it's asking about economics or social, make sure you address those. Know that the themes are connected. The themes are connected. And then when you're doing sourcing, don't forget to include the significance. Whew. Take a breath. Next steps. Next step. So before we leave, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the Google form that is available at the bottom of this YouTube video and give me some feedback. What questions do you still have about content and skills that we reviewed today? What did you enjoy most about it? Was there something that was helpful? What was most useful to something that you learned? And then what suggestions or questions do you have for future sessions? So please make sure you give me some feedback. I definitely read it and I always take it to heart and I use it to make sure that we can improve for the next time. So thank you. Thank you for hanging in there. I know we went a little bit over time, but thank you for hanging in there. I look forward to seeing you again the rest of this week. Enjoy your rest of your day, and I will see you later in the week.